This morning we're continuing with our studies in the Gospel of Luke, and we're reading from uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 to 26. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountain site to pray and spent the night praying to God. When the morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. And God will bless His Word to us. We, we've been looking at the life of Jesus, at His ministry, as it's uh, told to us by Luke. In chapter 4, we, found, we, we heard how He launched his, um, his ministry in Nazareth by announcing that the kingdom had come. And then over the last two weeks, we've been looking at conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees. And you, you will remember that uh, last week we saw the, the two parables that Jesus told about the new cloth on the old garment and the new wine in the new wineskins. And things have come to the point where now Jesus is going really to inaugurate the new order. He has announced that something new is coming, and this is the beginning of it. And we see four things about the new order in this passage. We see, first of all, the power of the new order. Then we see the people of the new order. Then we see the signs of the new order. And then the principles of the new order. And we're going to look at each of those in detail. And first of all, the power of the new order. It says, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. This wasn't actually unusual for Jesus. It tells us in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus often went into a solitary place to pray. When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he said, I don't come to tell you things from myself. I come to tell you what my father has told me. How did Jesus know what his father wanted him to say? He knew it because he spent time in prayer. It's very easy for us, I think, as Christians, to forget that Jesus was truly a man. He was a human being in every way as we are, except that he didn't sin. He had the same need to depend on God that we have. I know it's very difficult because he is God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings, but he is still a true man with all of that means. But if it was necessary for Jesus to spend time in prayer, 
in order to find power for his ministry, how much more is it necessary for us to spend time in prayer for our ministry? And it's interesting. I would say it was coincidence, except that there never is a coincidence with the Holy Spirit. We were talking today about the need to identify leaders in the church. That's just what Jesus is doing here. In this point in time, Jesus feels the time has come when he must appoint leaders to take his kingdom forward. And before he chooses those leaders, he spends all night in prayer. Jesus knew these people. He had called Peter and James, uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John from their fishing boats. He'd actually met them earlier because when they'd been following John the Baptist, he had met them there. He'd known them for some time, but he didn't just depend on the fact that, oh, I know these people, they're okay. He spent time in prayer that God would confirm to him the choices he was making. A lesson for us. And then there's the people of the new order. They're a rum crowd, to say the least. One of our problems is that for the last 2,000 years, people have designated them as saint. So we think of Saint Matthew, Saint Andrew, Saint James, Saint John. They didn't think of themselves like that, and Jesus didn't think of them like that. These weren't special people, different from the rest of us. These were ordinary men, very ordinary men. What about Simon? Impetuous, unstable, denying Jesus three times. And yet, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he becomes the leader of the church. It's Peter who six weeks after he denies Jesus because he's afraid of a servant girl, stands up in Jerusalem in front of all of the people and says to them, you lot, you kill the Son of God. God can transform people. James and John, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. They were quick-tempered. They were aggressive. They, Jesus and the disciples were going through Samaria one day, and they came to a village, and Jesus said, could the village entertain them? And the village said, no, you're on your way to Jerusalem. You're not coming in here. James and John said, Lord, shall we call thunder, fire down from heaven and destroy them? They were aggressive. Not only that, they were ambitious. Luke chapter 9, we're told that their mother comes with them to see Jesus and says, um, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, could one of my sons sit on your right hand and the other on your left hand? Could they be the most prominent people in the kingdom? Jesus says, it's not for me to decide that. And yet, John, this aggressive, ambitious, driven man, is the apostle of love. When you read his gospel and you read the epistles, love just flows through this man. Jesus can transform them. Now, what about this pairing? Matthew and Simon the Zealot. Matthew, you will remember, is a tax collector. He's a collaborator. He's a quizzling. He, he's a traitor. He serves the Roman authorities. Simon is a zealot. The zealots were a terrorist group. They were committed to acts of terror, acts of violence, to get rid of the Romans. Absolute poles apart but they come together and they become brothers in Christ. You see, it's not what we are that matters. 
It's what Jesus can make of us. And Jesus took these 12 unlikely men and he designated them apostles. And Paul tells us that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. These people were the bedrock on which Jesus depended for the church to go forward. And then we have the signs of the new order. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. The first sign of the new order was its inclusiveness. There were all of his a large crowd of his disciples, and at this point in time, most of them were from Galilee. So there was a whole bunch of Galileans. But then there were a great number of people from all over Judea. Now, there is a north-south divide in the United Kingdom. It may even get more of a divide if uh, Alex Salmond has his way. <laughs> but that north-south divide was present in Israel as well. The Galileans were despised. You can never be quite sure about the Galileans because there were a lot of Gentiles living in Galilee. And you were never quite sure if they were really fully Jewish in their approach. The Judeans, on the other hand, we were the people and we were the faithful ones. But Jesus attracts both. And then, of course, there are the people from Jerusalem. Now, you all know what Londoners are like. They think they're better than the rest of us. The people from Jerusalem were just the same. They were a cut above the ordinary people, but they came to Jesus. And then there were the people from Tyre and Sidon. And they were Gentiles. They weren't Jews. And Jesus draws people from all levels of society, from all conditions of people, from all races, and they all come together. And Jesus says, in my new order, it's not just the Jews, it's the Gentiles as well who we brought into the kingdom of God. And then there was healing. There was physical healing. They came to be healed of their diseases. There was spiritual healing. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured. But there was more to this than just people are sick and need to be healed, and Jesus healed them. This was a sign that the kingdom of God had come. This, if you remember back to Luke chapter 4, Jesus read from Isaiah, I've come to preach good news to the poor, uh, healing, uh, recovery of sight to the blind, to free the oppressed. And this is what is being demonstrated. The people were expecting that when the Messiah came, miracles would occur. So the disciples of John come to Jesus and say, John's terribly worried. Are you the Messiah? Because Jesus wasn't quite the kind of Messiah that John had been expecting, let alone anybody else. And John, uh, Jesus says to them, go back and tell John what you've seen. The lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life. These are the signs that the Messiah has come and the kingdom has been inaugurated. And then Jesus begins to teach. And he begins to declare the principles of the new order. And this particular passage we know as the Sermon on the Plain. It's got a familiar ring to it. If you remember the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, it's got a kind of similarity. And there are many learned pages and much vaporing that goes on about was the Sermon on the Mount the same as this sermon? Um, what's going on? 
I think this is a different sermon because it's not on a mount, it's on a level place. And isn't Jesus allowed to preach the same thing more than once? In fact, Jesus is the greatest teacher who's ever, allowed, ever lived. And one of the principles of good teaching is repetition. You tell people something and then you tell them it again. And with my students, again and again and again. Hopefully one day it sinks in. But you repeat the things that are important. So if Jesus thought these things needed to be repeated, it's because as far as Jesus is concerned, these things are absolutely critical. This is what the kingdom of God is all about. It's different from the Sermon on the Mount because in addition to the blessings which uh, Jesus proclaims, he also proclaims woes. And he teaches in this contrast, blessed are the poor, woe to the rich, and so on. But what he does is completely reverse what you would expect. Because the people he says are blessed are the ones that when you look at them, you'd feel sorry for them. And the people he says, woe to you, are the people that you'd look at them and you'd be jealous of them. And it's a complete turnaround from the way we normally think of things. The word blessed is an interesting one. Um, it, it's very difficult to get exactly the sense of what it means. It, it means happy, but it means more than just the emotion of being happy, of sort of feeling really good about yourself. It is being happy because you have got very good grounds to be happy. So we do tend to use the, the, the term in common parlance. We say that somebody is blessed with good looks. All that goes with being good looking belongs to that person. So Jesus says here, blessed are the poor. They've got something to be happy about. They've got every reason for joy and gladness. Again, there's a great deal of debate about who Jesus is talking about when he talks about the poor. It is absolutely clear throughout the whole of Scripture that God has a special concern for the poor and that he lays on us as his people that concern for the poor. So it is entirely right and appropriate that Archbishop Vince Nichols, the uh, head of the Catholic Church in England, has castigated the government this week for its treatment of the poor. God bless him, it's time more of the churches were saying things like that. We've become afraid of actually declaring God's word to the people in power. Our problem is we've been brought up to believe that the state is one thing and the church is the another, and the state gets on with its things, and the church is a private matter of private religion. Never in the whole of Scripture is religion a private matter. Our faith has to impact on the world around us. And God calls us to proclaim his concern for poor, for the poor, and for justice in this world. Remember, in Matthew 25, at the judgment seat, what is it that Jesus says as king to the people he's judging? I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. God has concern for the poor. But here, this is going much beyond just economic poverty. In Matthew, Matthew reports Jesus as saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I would suggest that the whole point is that to be poor is to be aware of your need. The rich are complacent. I have everything I need. 
In Revelation 3, we, we read the words of the risen Christ to the uh, church at Laodicea. Laodicea was a wealthy city. The church was a solid middle-class middle church. They had everything physically that they needed, materially that they needed. And Jesus says to him, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. White clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. It is absolutely possible to be comfortably off economically and to be completely poor in God's eyes. And the poverty that Jesus is talking about here is that awareness of need. When we come to God, we can bring Him nothing. This kind of goes against our instincts because we've been brought up to believe that you have to offer God something. I will do good works and God will be pleased with me. I will make an effort to improve and God will be pleased with me. And Jesus says, no. It's when you come and you realize that you have got absolutely nothing. It's then that God can bless you. And the blessing you're given is that yours is the kingdom of God. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 that we are heirs with, of God and co-heirs with Christ. The kingdom of God is ours. We may be poor because we have nothing to give to God, but he gives us everything. And the kingdom of God is ours. Not because of anything we do. You cannot work to improve your standing in the kingdom. You can only rely completely on God to come and give it to you. And then we have, blessed are you who hunger, for you will be satisfied, contrasted with, woe to you who are well fed, for you will go hungry. And again, hunger is a major challenge in the world today. Huge numbers of people in the world do not have enough to eat. And it is right and it is proper that the church becomes involved in dealing with hunger. And so the churches in Dereham, we've come together to form the food bank. Vincent Nichols said that it is one of the great shames of this wealthy country. And we may have slipped from fourth place in the world rankings of wealth but we're still in seventh place. And seventh place out of 190 countries is still pretty rich. And as he says, it's a shame that in a wealthy country like ours, people are having to depend on food banks. But they do, and so we provide the food bank. That's right and proper. Fair trade is right and proper. And so we support the fair trade organization to make sure that people get a fair return for what they grow. But again, Jesus is talking about something more than physical hunger. This is the hunger after God himself. And we hunger when we're desperate for more. Very few of us here this morning have really experienced real hunger. We may have gone without a meal for a day, maybe even two days. But the desperation for food that comes when you are truly hungry is something we've not experienced. But this is what Jesus is talking about. It is that desperation 
to know God. It's that desperation to feel the presence of God in our lives. It's that desperation for God to come in and take over. The well-fed, they're content with what they have. And how many of us are like that? We've got just enough Christianity to make us comfortable. We know we're going to heaven, and that's all that matters. And if we go through a bad time, we can pray and we can feel the comfort of God's presence. And that is not what Jesus is looking for. Jesus wants a complete commitment, a complete hunger for more and more of Him. And if we have that, He promises that we will be filled. When we want God, when we long for God, He comes and He fills us. But if we're complacent, if we think that everything's okay, then it won't satisfy. There will come that point when we realize that it's all empty. It's all just words. It's all just a matter of habit. And we won't have anything to cling to. And then we have the contrast between weeping and laughing. What are they weeping about? Again, it is true that if we are mourning, if we're bereaved, then God brings us comfort. But again, it is more than that that we're thinking about here. It is looking at the world around us with God's eyes and feeling His heart. Because God looks at the world around us and weeps. God looks at injustice and weeps. God looks at suffering and weeps. In Islam, God is impassable. Nothing touches him. But our God, as revealed in Jesus Christ, is a God who weeps. Remember the scene at the tomb of Lazarus? It, it's an incredible thing when you think about it. Because Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, everybody is mourning, and Jesus weeps. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus in the next minute. But still he feels the sorrow of those around him. And God calls us to share that sorrow that other people have, to feel it and to weep with them. And the laughter, I think that speaks of an insensitivity to what's going on around us. It is very easy for us to become closed in in our own little protected bubble and to have a really good time and to really enjoy ourselves and to come along to church and to sing wonderful songs and really to feel that uh, everything's great and we're not seeing the suffering out there. Jesus says, if we are those who weep, we will laugh because he is working and we will see him at work and it will bring us real joy. But if we're the kind of people who ignore other people's suffering, then finally we will be weeping because one day we're going to stand before him and he's going to say to us, you saw me in prison and you didn't visit me. You saw me hungry and you didn't feed me. And finally, the blessing when men hate you, the blessing of being persecuted as opposed to the woe of being applauded. This is completely topsy-turvy. And you just don't understand this at all, do you? Jesus is specific. 
when men hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. There is that rider that it's when they do it because of the Son of Man, because of your faithfulness to Christ. It is perfectly possible to be hated, reviled, and excluded just because you are an awkward person. And that is not what God is, what Jesus is talking about. I have met Christians who took glory in the fact that they were persecuted. They weren't being persecuted because they were Christians, they were just awkward souls. But if we are faithful in proclaiming God's word, then some people will reject us. Some people will exclude us. And we're to rejoice because that's what they did to the prophets. In other words, it is a mark of being a true prophet. Of course, some people will receive the word with gladness. C.H. Spurgeon, who said, when you preach, people should either be glad, mad, or sad, or possibly all three. And if you're not having any effect, if people are not responding either positively or negatively to what you're saying, it means you're not saying the right things. You're not proclaiming Jesus. And those whom all men applaud are false prophets. Now, again, be careful. It doesn't say when some men disagree with you, you're a false prophet, or when some men applaud you, you're a false prophet. It's when everybody does that you start worrying. These are incredibly high standards. There was a fashion at one time for watering them down and saying, these are the standards of the kingdom, they're for the future. But of course, we know the kingdom is now. And these are the standards that Jesus expects of us now. So the question is, are we actually prepared to live according to Jesus' kingdom values? We've sung this morning about Jesus' sacrifice for us. He came, He died, so that we could come into a relationship with Him. All He asks of us is that we give ourselves totally to Him. It's not really a lot to ask, is it? Thank you, band. <clears throat>